Welcome back to Rethinking Politics, episode 81. We're going to talk some more Russia. We're going to talk some more Ukraine. We're going to talk more about the conflict. Uh, First, an update, brief update, news on the ground before we get into some of the particulars that are affecting people like oil and gas, the threat of nuclear war, etc. Bringing you this news is oh, I didn't realize. Bradley, didn't, I was I was over here like, man, tell us what is going on on the ground, Dan. I'm so curious. Oh wait, that's me. Profes- professional news handoff in three, two, one. I was I was wrapped audience above, over here. Cue, cue the light above Brad's booth, please. I was I was enjoying listening to your episode. <laughs> so things on the ground have not progressed. As quickly as as Putin and and many others would wished would have wished, they've also not stopped in the way Ukraine would have wished. I'm sure um, Russia's troops continue to advance. They've taken uh, several several cities. They've besieged several other cities. They continue to advance towards Kiev. They continue to to shell these cities night and day. So so the war is is on and it's on full steam but we're kind of we're kind of stagnating here. I mean this I mean this is this is the reality of war is that sometimes it just well I mean, not sometimes it always just sucks but sometimes nothing decisive happens and that's I think what's going on here. I mean obviously the same factors that were playing a week ago are still playing today which is that Russia has serious, you know, supply issues, they have morale issues, and they have logistical issues. On the flip side, Ukraine is is vastly, you know, out outmanned and outgunned. And, you know, their their economy is is completely halted, you know, for the duration of this war. So they're not producing anything. They're not I mean, they're they're struggling to produce power for their cities. They're struggling to have enough to eat. I mean, these are very real problems. And so the question becomes, you know, of these two groups that are both in bad situations, who's going to cave in first, you know? And I don't know. I just don't know. Yes. Uh, and we'll, we'll definitely talk more about potential ways in which it could cave in um, when we talk about Putin and, and the way that you know, people use the term off ramp, a diplomatic off ramp, or a, a, some kind of agreement that allows him to save face, and because this has been a disaster, and allows peace to be restored while while providing some kind of a story that that lets lets Putin go home with a win. Oh, and I just want to um, say one more thing about that because the obvious please. response to that is well, the entire Western world has rallied around Ukraine and is trying to send in supplies and weapons. The problem is is getting those supplies and weapons to the people who need them. Mm-hmm. Um, right now, you know, so much of Ukraine is is being actively attacked, and and there are troops in so many different areas of Ukraine that getting those supplies, getting those weapons, getting all of those things to the people of Ukraine is becoming incredibly difficult. Um, just recently, Poland made a surprise statement saying that they were ready to give their MiG fighters, the same fighters that Ukrainian pilots use, over to the U.S. so the U.S. could hand them off to the Ukrainian fighters. And and the U.S. intelligence um, agencies responded and said, this, is, this may not be tenable because there are so many logistical problems to get those fighters in the condition they need to be and to the Ukrainians who need them when the airspace over Ukraine is hotly contested. You know, how do you, how do you fly planes into, into a war zone where at any point they could be struck down by surface to air missiles? Because if you have U S troops fly them in, well now U S troops are, are potentially at risk of, of getting killed in a war that they're not supposed to be a part of. Well, who's supposed to fly the planes in? Okay. Well now we need to get Ukrainians out. We need to, you know, it's, it just becomes simple things like that. Like we have what you need take it is not that easy it's it's shockingly hard how the the logistics of war um especially if you're deploying fielding a large amount of equipment and soldiers at that point it just becomes it becomes a nightmare um i remember listening to dan carlin's hardcore history if you if you aren't familiar with that and you're interested in history you should give it a look um he was talking about uh world war one 
I'm trying to remember the title of it. He has interesting titles for each of his his things, and the title is not World War One, but it was on World War One, and he he was talking about how the the German army when it was deployed, uh, it had something, it had over a million people. It might have been two million people in it, which is just an obscene number of people, mm-hmm. and just people watching it march, and what it took to get the food and equipment and and the mail to the soldiers to make sure each one has a functional pair of boots, right? That their guns are in enough shape that they can fire and that they can be distributed and that they can be mobilized into fighting, you know, to fight very quickly. Mm-hmm. Like it, it was a truly a work of logistical genius given the technology at the time and what the and resources they had to make that even the Germans happen, yeah. to deploy that army and for it not to starve to death. Like just, just to be, not to just like be bogged down somewhere, unable to get what it needs. It's, it's insane. It's insane. The supply lines and the logistics and, uh, Russia's deploying a much, much smaller force than that, but still having tons of problems. And it, it, it takes, it, it, problems with these things should be the norm. Obviously the, we're used to seeing much more efficient groups, especially since Usually we're looking at the U S and the U S deploying a relatively small force. Um, and so they're much more precise and much better, better stocked. Yeah. I mean, that's Um, been the U S's MO for several decades now where we, where we will deploy incredibly small forces in terms of these kind mm -hmm. of numbers, you know, we're not sending in 400,000 troops, you know, we're sending in 2000 troops that are incredibly well equipped and well supplied and well organized all the air support and the the coordination that you could possibly want that makes those troops much more effective per capita than any other army in the world yes um and it's it's really interesting it's a side of war that we don't think about we just take it for granted that you can deploy that that the raw numbers matter and they do but if you can't bring the pieces together and which is extremely hard to do the raw numbers matter less and less um, it's it's cool. A fun fact: uh, uh, this Ukrainian war, there have been as many as twenty thousand uh, Ukrainians are reporting. They've had twenty thousand volunteers from other countries show up and join their join their military resistance. Yeah, and I'd take that um, number with a grain of salt. Yes, as you should. All of the stories coming out of here. Um, there's a lot of hero stories. There's the one with the the island of people. The island with like. Uh, a dozen Ukrainians that was somehow strategically important and the Russians told them to surrender and they said F you and the Russians killed them all and they were like heroes and turns out that never happened or doesn't seem like it's happened at this point. Um, there's a lot of other myths going on out there um, about interactions and, you know, heroic Ukrainians standing up and the Ukrainian resistance has been heroic and has been amazing, but it's just you get you get wartime myths to boost morale. And yeah, and it's like all that. mixed together, and and facts get convoluted, and so even things that are based on real events may be inaccurate. I heard there's a Ukrainian super soldier named uh, Captain Ukraine. He's probably real. <laughs> well, that one we know is real. We're talking about the other ones that are that are more questionable. Everyone knows about Captain Ukraine. I grew up reading about Captain Ukraine. <laughs> Goes camp to camp, rallying spirits. Uh, anyway, yeah, news on the ground. Um, I really like breaking points for their coverage on this. There's some other news sites you can find that are that are doing a good job. If you want the real strategic breakdown, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, critical threats um, is a, is amazing. Um, they give you their war analysts and they they're writing detailed updates. You know, very precise, very careful. Um, the, the kind of thing that news organizations use as sources. So um, anyway, you can find good information on the day-to-day stuff, but I'm frankly, I'm surprised that I'm surprised. I'm pleasantly surprised that it hasn't fallen yet and that it's so bogged down. Um, I think a lot of people will be confused by this because at least they should be confused because a lot of people think that the U S people armed with small arms could not resist the U.S. government. And they think, if you don't have tanks, you don't have air support, there's just no way you can fight back. But you can see exactly the problem. You can see why that's not true in the way that Putin has to deal with these cities. Because he could, he could, in theory, go, this city is holding out. It's really hard to take it. 
let's just blow the city up. We have enough explosives, right? We could hit it, we could hit it with a nuclear missile even or something. Mm-hmm. You don't even need to go that far, right? You, you could blow the city up. You can't do that for, for, uh, for a variety of reasons. Your, the morale of your own soldiers, mm-hmm. the morale of your opponents, and the international backlash. Mm-hmm. You, you have to be very careful. Um, I've heard reports of Putin targeting civilians. I don't know how credible they are. Um, no doubt there's going to be a lot of collateral damage and there will be mistakes as there always are. No, and, and if he and, starts blowing up cities, there's going to be international. I was going to say, up. even as it is, he is suffering. He's on the line. backlash yeah. because of the fact that he is that so many of the people he's fighting are civilians and, and right next to yeah. civilians. And it's the 21st century. And so you're getting video footage and photos of civilians who were, were killed just as they were trying to cross the street. And that, and even, even as you said, there is collateral damage, but even if it's, even if it was collateral and not intentional, it looks very, very bad. If you take that to the next level, there'll be no, there'll be no hiding behind excuses. And then, and then you really could, you see yourself in, in, in a war with NATO, which is not something that Putin wants. Yes. Yes. There's a, there's a fine line here where if he, and, and Russia has been, has a reputation for doing this kind of thing in Syria where they're indiscriminate. And they need to be discriminant with the eyes of the world on them right now, just for practical reasons. And if they start getting too far out of line, um, public opinion, like the U.S., 80% of the people in the U.S. wanted to cut off Russian oil. Which, which is crazy. It's, everyone is so united against Russia. In some ways, you, you give people an excuse and you could see real, you could see NATO going in. No, I mean, I mean. People are in favor of that. People are in favor of uh, of a no fly zone. No fly zone, which that's is right. which is crazy because that's actually a a military action. You know, that's not a sanction. That's taking the that's crossing that invisible line into into war, into conflict, open conflict. But people are people are in favor of it because in many ways people do want open conflict that they see Russia invading. And they want us to do something. They don't want yeah. to actually fight there, but they want us to do something. And and they see the no fly zone as as that kind of option, that kind of best of both worlds, which everything comes at a cost. You know, the idea that we can stop Russia and hurt Russia and save Ukraine without it cost us anything is obviously illogical. I mean, we're seeing that now with with the oil crisis. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. If our audience probably knows this, but you can't, the way you get a no fly zone is you shoot planes out of the air. You, you get air superiority. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, you send your planes into that no fly zone Mm -hmm. and, and maintain it. You, or, or, or set up, you know, missile batteries there. You have to do something with military force to maintain that no fly zone. Right. That, that may not put boots on the ground, I guess, technically, depending on how you did it, but it's, it's, but it's basically, it's a, it's a military intervention and, and it would be viewed as an act of war. Um, rightfully so, because it would be, it would be us attacking their planes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, yeah, people, like people are trying to get sold into this war and just be cautious of things like that. People are like, Oh no, no, this isn't war. This is just a no fly zone. And then we'd act all surprised when our planes get shot down. We'd be like, now we got to go in. <laughs> um, oil is, is the <laughs> people are, the economy is always one of the most important issues in politics. Oil is the most important issue in the economy. In a lot of ways, it drives up the prices of everything mm-hmm. um, to this day. And it's so affected by politics. Yes, and it's so that's right, that's right. Um, in most countries that are oil rich, the oil industry is entirely national. It's it's run by the government. It's, it's socialized, nationalized, whatever you want, whatever term you want to use. The government runs it, um, and it often in the oil rich countries, it is usually a massive portion of their income and exports and things like that. Russia, Iraq. Um, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, uh, Venezuela, um, etc. Um, what do all these countries have in common? Well, <laughs> Canada is another one, surprisingly enough. But uh, but Canada, I, I had no idea Canada was exporting 
really anything. <laughs> and, uh, until, Except for uh, maple syrup. Don't forget just, maple syrup. <laughs> we like harassing Canada. I, I like Canada. I like. I, I thought of. Fleeing I mean, it's to a Canada. it's a national pastime. <laughs> Ever since the War of eighteen twelve, when when Americans are bored, we we either harass or attack Canada. <laughs> attack Canada. Ironically, we lose those wars, but <laughs> it's fine. No it's one fine. cares. <laughs> If I were Canadian, I'd care. I'd be like, remember when we just slapped you around? You thought you could come in and <laughs> make fun of our French? America's um, like, no, I don't remember. <laughs> no, actually. Did that happen? We, we blotted that out from our history books. <laughs> We've never lost a war. So it looks like, and uh, and the White House has declared, we're going to stop importing Russian oil. Um, that's a that's recent development in the news. It'll be a day or two old when we when we post this. Even if we weren't importing Russian oil, that would massively affect that the, sorry, if we were not importing Russian oil, the EU refusing Russian oil or countries in general refusing Russian oil um, would affect us. And it's because there's a process, well, there's a world market for oil, and there are processes by which the oil is moved from one place to another and refined and then turned into, uh, you know, various oil-based products. Um, plastics and things. Um, and along with obviously the oil that we're consuming directly is things like, or more directly as gasoline and other stuff. Um, people are looking at the prices jumping and they're trying to figure out what do we, what do we do about it? Well, the prices are going to go up. They're going to go up whether or not we refuse oil. <laughs> Brad, you pointed out something interesting about political strategy here. It may be, oh, go ahead. Oh, you, I, you I just said that, that in many ways, uh, the the White House was catching up to the times when when they issued their ban because prices were already rising as that happened, and if if they hadn't passed that ban, then it would look like we're just victims of circumstance, and the White House in particular is just a victim of circumstance and would get blamed for this increase in gas prices. But now, when when President Biden says we are banning Russian oil and costs are going to go up. But that's the price of freedom, and that's the price of a war that has almost universal approval among U.S. citizens. It makes his position a lot, a lot better. I mean, the the optics on it are really, really good because now yes. this is a wartime thing. It's something we're all in it together, and that's something people can get behind versus, oh, no, this is just Biden's economic policy blowing up in his face again. But yes. if he hadn't done that, prices still would have gone up because you already had individual companies, you know, who were backing away from from deals with Russia. And you already had other nations that were backing away from Russia. And that was increasing the price of oil independent of what the U.S. officially did. Yes, yes. So it, it made perfect sense for him to seize that opportunity. Be like, this is this is popular with the people. This oil prices are going to go up anyway. And it makes him look They'll strong. They'll a little more with us doing this, yes. And it, and it makes it look like we're willingly taking on what's actually going to happen. Not not quite to the same degree, probably. We'd, we'd keep it a little cheaper. But close. I mean, if you were, yeah, yes, if you were a, if you were a true political, like, devil may care, we're in it for our own good. What you'd do right now is you'd go to Russia and you'd go, hey, we're going to increase how much oil we're buying from you. But we're going to want a discount. <laughs> we're going to capitalize on the fact that your your market is disappearing. You know, there's, but you still there's got to be some small time. nation somewhere who's considering that right now. They're like, we yes. can get oil out of steel. Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, but anyway, obviously, if the U.S. did that, that would be that would be terrible. We'd be like, wait a second. <laughs> but anyway, there you go. There's the the business of oil. Um, uh, on the broader subject of oil and energy independence, because this is what people are talking about now. They're like, okay, so what do we What do we do, do just to combat the rise in prices? What do we do in the short run? Well, the answer We've is- We've got just a bunch of oil sitting around, right? <laughs> sort of, I guess, our strategic, uh, whatever it's called. <laughs> the answer is obvious, Dan. In the short run, what we need to do is invest in renewable energy. Oh, gosh. I, I no comeback. I've huh? heard that propose. <laughs> That's what I thought. No, sorry. Drop that the could... mic. Walk away. 
Who's next? <laughs> I've heard that proposed by people who are very familiar with politics who should know better. Um, renewable energy to this day. So right now we are oil is we're using the least amount of oil for energy. Is that the right way to phrase this? Or not the least total amount, but as a percentage. As a Because our total yes, energy good, consumption good, total, has increased yes. year over year, but the percentage of our energy coming from oil has decreased. Yeah. Yeah. So it was it was uh it peaked at ninety-four percent of all energy was was oil based, was generated through oil of some kind, or natural fossil gas, fuels. fossil fuel. Because that includes coal, right? And fossil fuels. Because there's yes. there's no way that ninety four percent of yes. our energy was just yes. oil no, in nineteen sixty six. You were correct. You were correct. Fossil fuels. You were correct. Yeah. So so there's a and I'm conflating the two because this is uh, when we talk energy, we're talking fossil fuels versus, versus renewable. Even though yes. coal and oil are very different. Yes. Yes. But are both are fossil fuels. Um, yes. So. So switching into fossil fuels, not not oil particularly, fossil fuels make up currently, or currently in 2019, um, all of current our data enough ever <laughs> that we look at lately is 2019. It's like people don't. Did we just not collect data during COVID? <laughs> it just seems to have stopped. Um, sometimes it's because we deliberately want before yeah, COVID. Yeah. This time it's just what we found. Um, was it 80 percent? 80% of it is fossil fuel based. Um, and it is a ridiculous amount. Uh, obviously, the raw numbers be meaningless, but it's like 18 million barrels per. Uh, 18 million barrels a day of. of a uh, day. I think that's crude oil or is that oil products? I'll have to look. I think that's oil consumption. Um, yeah, oil. And, and if we were to look at fossil fuels, and obviously you'd have to measure it differently, um, but it's it's going to be a crazy amount. Um, we we are a long ways away from being able to replace all of that with renewable. The closest we could get to that, the like if we we were to just throw the entire weight of the federal government behind it, um, it would still take, I think well over a decade it would take ridiculous amounts of money it would restructure our economy you would have to change all kinds of things um i mean people had this idea of the zero emission mm -hmm. zero uh zero emissions um and getting rid of of our dependence on fossil fuels and um and and, and this idea that the future of energy is not fossil fuels. It's renewables mostly. Um, some of those people are open to nuclear, um, and many which I aren't. Guess is renewable. Most of them, yeah. Depending on your political alignment, you probably aren't. Um, we really like nuclear, uh, but anyway, and we've we've talked to energy before and, and how nuclear should be. We should be using a lot more nuclear. But if you think that this is the time that we can just use this opportunity of high oil prices to transition to renewable energy and other things. And that that is a short term solution. You're up in the night. I heard somebody say there's no reason to increase drilling because drilling is not is essentially not the future and it's it's not a short term solution. And then they proposed investing in renewables. And I I was just baffled by this. Like even even if you hate fossil fuels on the basis of of to some degree, at least misunderstandings on the, on the environmental level. Um, that is the present and it's going to be here for a long time still. And there's no, there's no transition out of it right now. We have to find oil and we have to find it ASAP. Um, or we just start driving way, way less, which is, which is not going to happen. Our economy isn't built for it, right? We, we don't have the the means to do that. Public transit isn't even going to, wouldn't even make a debt, dent in most of these cases. Um, the short term is, unfortunately, pick your least, pick of the like five worst countries, <laughs> five of the worst countries in the world, decide which one of them you want to give a massive amount of money to, to help fund their dictatorship. That's our, <laughs> that's our current, it's not even, do we have to pay a terrible <laughs> dictator? who is extremely corrupt doing terrible things to their people. It's which one. 
Which one? You know, it sounds like you're you're joking, Dan, but but recently we were we were sanctioning Venezuela and and reducing our oil consumption from Venezuela and sure enough, as we turn away from Russia, one of the countries we're considering moving back to and increasing our oil um purchases from is Venezuela. You know, the the yeah. the reasons for sanctioning them haven't really changed. What's changed is simply the political landscape where where we're like, oh, well, well, the Russian dictator's out. Well, which dictators are in? You know, well, no one cares about Venezuela right now. All they care about is Russia. So let's go. But but even that doesn't doesn't solve the issue, because as you said before, we've got a world market of oil. And we've got a reduced supply. You know, if if no one's going to buy from Russia or at least buy in, in reduced mm-hmm. amounts, there's going to be a supply and demand problem, at least temporarily. Yeah. I yeah, mean, the people buying Russian oil will have to buy other oil mm-hmm. and that will drive up the prices. Yeah, it's just, exactly. Yeah, it's you not increase it's, the supply. It's not like no one else is interested. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, so yeah, so, so companies are naturally going to ramp up their production if that's a possibility. You know, it's yeah. in most cases, it's not quite that simple because if they could make more, they would have already been making more because they could have sold it. You know what I mean? And so, but there is the fact that as oil prices go up, they can produce more less efficiently and have it still be justified in the cost, in the in the price, excuse me. But so in the short run, prices are going to go up and there's not really anything we can do to stop that. I mean, the only thing the U.S. could do is release more of the reserves, which yeah. is which is a, a risk increase move. the supply. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's just use, you know, it's basically a, an oil subsidy. You know, is is just subsidize oil for everyone by just dumping some of our 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 reserves. But that's a dangerous game to play because there are reserves. Um, yeah, I'm just waiting for Biden to start fixing prices. <laughs> that'll that'll and, really and, help. And then good luck getting to work as as the shortages sweep the nation. No, it's the shortage becomes no, yeah. no, and that's a that's Devastated. a that's a great reminder, Dan. And that's something that's worth noting here is that prices are going up, and that's very unfortunate. But it's not as bad as we're making it out to be because we can still put gas in our car and get to work. And mm-hmm. in so many parts of the world, you know, with the fluctuations of the market, that's not the case where having reliable fuel is not a given. And mm-hmm. and so increased prices is not the worst thing that can happen. And and let's not be too drastic in what we do because we could have, have much worse. And I think in the, you know, in the medium run, prices are going to balance out you know we're going to they're not going to go increase forever because it's just one country that's had a major change things will stabilize mm-hmm. out people are going to drive less so demand's going to go down and and we should hit a plateau at some point here yes yeah in the long run energy independence is ideal um yeah, we mentioned we meant use the term a market an international market of uh of oil, by which we mean in this case, not a market in the sense that we're usually want to market. This is this is a bunch of <laughs> a bunch of cartels who are competing against each other. So there is a market, but it's not a, a it's a weird market. It's a weird market. It's like the internet market. <laughs> so we have a we have in the US, I'm gonna try not try hard not to think too much about that and get distracted, but that's where my brain now wants to go to discuss that with you. Um, the U.S. is interesting because the U.S. does have a market to some degree, at least. I suppose I haven't looked at the the laws and things too closely. Um, but in theory, at least, there are, there are companies We, we don't have national other. oil production. We don't have national oil production. So it's at least more in that direction, though that's not necessarily always always better. We've talked sometimes about how some you can get in between the two and it just creates a ridiculous game. Mm-hmm. Um, see Texas energy grid for more information <laughs> um, where you're like, this is, this is private. So it's, it's going to have all the benefits of a market. No, you can, you can create a system that's semi-private that has all of the downsides of a private market and all the downsides of a government run industry. <laughs> you know, it's it's funny cuz I always wondered why they even had the lose lose category and and now we know why. <laughs> and now we know why. Um but uh if energy independence, we we were looking at oil and I found a number of things here that shocked me. <laughs> For example, we produce 20% 
of the world's oil. Yeah, we're the we're the that, we're the largest producer of oil in the world, right? Yes, the producer, we're number one. Exporter, we are not number one. Which is which is if you're thinking in your head that can't be right because I know something about oil and, and, and I know we're not Russia in the top three of exporters. Arabia. No, no, we're not. Um, but the answer for that is really simple. It's because we're also one of the largest consumers, and so we're consuming a large portion of our own oil. Where it gets a little odd, and in a centralized uh, people who want to centralize things will look at this and be like, "This is why we should centralize it." Mm-hmm. Is that we are producing? Was it slightly less or slightly, slightly more than more? We're so in 2020, America produced 18.4 million barrels of oil per day and consumed 18.12 million. And this is according to. Uh, an article on NASDAQ, which is based off an article of NBC News, which is based off of this one report from the uh, U.S. Energy Information Administration. Yeah, if I had to guess, and this is this is a testament to political propaganda, and that, that we we fall prey to it as uh, occasionally as well. I would have guessed that we all the time. To, all the time, it's hard. If you're not looking at it directly, you're probably going up based off of some myth. If you were, you were to guess from how Republicans talk about our oil production, you would guess that we are producing not I would have nearly said, enough. If I had to guess, I would have said like 2 or 3% of the world's oil. Maybe less. I maybe would have guessed less. That we're, that we're producing 20% is crazy. And I would have guessed and, that we were producing half of what we consumed. You know what I mean? Yes. That if we were consuming 18 million a day, I would assume that we were producing 9 million. Something like that. And so we needed to get the other 9 million from the other countries. Because I know we're, we're heavily reliant on imports for oil. So why do we import a bunch of oil, Brad? Well, as someone who's a big fan of sugar, I can tell you it has to do with sweetness. <laughs> If anybody in the audience gets that joke, please tell me. Because there's something and wrong then... with you. <laughs> yeah, yes, and or you have, or you happen to 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 just be familiar with the the yes. oil industry. Yes, in ways that I've never heard these. I'd heard light and heavy. I'd never heard sweet. Anyway, please explain. <laughs> so. So, so right now, the U.S. Um, produces 18.4 million barrels, consumes 18.12, and we import 7.86 million barrels of oil per day. In other words, that means we're exporting, you know, a third or a little bit more than a third of what we produce each day and then importing back that same amount from somewhere else in order to balance our, our – uh, our oil sheets here, which is which sounds insane on paper, um, but is actually not not the most unusual thing. Um, the comedian mm-hmm. Brian Regan has a, a great skit where he's he's driving along and he sees a a truck going one way full of logs. A bit is the word you're looking for, but carry on. What did I say? A skit. <laughs> a skit. He acts, he it acts out. this out. <laughs> his impersonation. His impersonation of a truck is is. You have to it's see incredible. it. He has a bit. There's, I mean, if you've seen Brian Regan, he gets into it. You know, you could call it a skit, you know. He does. That's true. Fair enough. But he, he has a it. bit where where he's got a, you got a logging truck going in one direction on the road and a logging truck going the other direction, both fully loaded. And he's just like, you know, you had logs? You know, we, we, we got the order form, you know. Why Why are you shipping one product to point A from point B and the same thing back and forth? And that's exactly what's happening here. And and there's a lot of nuanced reasons that those same people who understood the sweetness reference will get about, about costs and about, you know, national trade deals and all of that. And all of that comes into play. But But the simplest answer is that there are actually different kinds of oil – and they're categorized by their weight and their sweetness, which has to do with how easy it is to refine, which is the weight, and the sulfur content, which is the sweetness. I personally have never tried oil, but next time I do, I will pay attention to that sulfur content to see how if sweet it you, really is. No, seriously, can we just take a second? Sweetness based on sulfur content? What? 
And and it scales the other way, right? So the, it's sweeter if it has less sulfur, right? Yeah. Well, and, and yeah. to be fair, all of the sweet things I've had have had a very low sulfur content. So maybe there is something <laughs> there. Anyway, funny the way these terms terms come about but so Sweetness. so basically what happens it's how is, we measure the absence of sulfur <laughs> so basically what happens is you have industries that are set up that are producing oil at a certain at a certain level in the united states certain, like grade or and something. then you have industries that want oil at a certain level that's a different level in the united states and in order for oil produced in the united states to then come back to the united states it needs to either be changed or the facility that's receiving it has to change their procedure. And so there's a cost. It may be an initial cost or it may be an ongoing cost. And then you couple that with you've got other nations that rely heavily on their exporting of oil who might be interested in undercutting those businesses in order to get you know, the U.S. business. And so it may be cheaper for those companies to export it even when you include transportation costs yeah and and the the way that you can tell this is all messed up and not market-based uh, among other ways is that if i want to get say <laughs> why is it i'm looking for some generic product and nothing comes to mind well <laughs> we'll say we'll say i want to get a new pair of headphones i buy whichever pair of headphones strikes me through some kind of market app, mm -hmm. usually like Amazon or something, and it's ordered from wherever the heck it is. Yeah. If I want to buy oil, I go and I lobby the government to make a deal with such and such country, because they run the oil production in their place, <laughs> for X amount of oil, and that's how it works, right? The, the company, a company that needs oil has to be you know, a refinery or something like that, or or some kind of oil product, must be so closely tied to our government because that is from whence the the product market exists, right? It's it's through large scale negotiations with mm -hmm. other countries. It is anyway. It's a it's a bad way to get cheap products from <laughs> reliably. If we have to be like, no, we're going to buy X amount from you. And anyway, anyway, it's a. Oil, oil is a mess, and it's going to be it's going to be driven a lot by politics. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because there's other factors. You know, you've got regulations. The regulations vary by country and, and country. The trade negotiations vary by country and country, and that creates. I mean, it creates situations where there are really screwed up incentives, which results in us, you know, shipping out. You know. 7 million barrels a day of oil in order to then ship back 7 million barrels or 7.86 millions of barrels of oil per day which even with the you know shipping costs being not insanely high when you think about how yeah, much 7 barges yeah 7 million barrels of oil is every day it's a lot of oil and and so of course the solution is um, the solution, according to a lot of people, is that what we need is we need government action. You know, we need to subsidize and incentivize with government those changes and maybe even centralize some of these processes in order to make sure that it all stays within the U.S. I don't think that's the solution, obviously. You guys know enough no. about us. No, it's not what we think the solution is. No, the, it's, the it's solution, like a mercantilist view almost. Of yeah, the solution is you you – you get out of the way and allow the the market to take place and usually you're going to find solutions the other thing to factor in is that it just doesn't it doesn't work even even when you factor in all of these things it doesn't change the fact that if we were producing all of our own oil but all of a sudden the market changed out there and oil companies in the U.S. could get a better price from another country, they would start selling to another country and oil prices would go up in the United States. So even if right now that 7.86 million number was lower, it doesn't mean we wouldn't be affected by this. You know yes. what I mean? That the global market always affects us and that we are, you know, members of 
global trade, and that's always going to affect us, and it's something that we need to we need to get a little bit more comfortable with. It doesn't yes. mean, though, that we shouldn't push for energy independence, and I think there are things that we can do. But honestly, right now, my answer is I don't know because I don't understand how the oil market works well enough to offer useful solutions. Yes, at which point is is usually what we, if we were going to do a deep analysis of this, what we'd look at is we'd look at all of the points, we'd find a dozen areas that are terrible, and we would propose two or three changes mm -hmm. um, that we think would make the biggest difference. And at this point, we're just looking big picture because it's a, it's a mess and there is zero will to make any changes. <laughs> like the only, the only solution proposed is, the only question right now is, are we going to centralize it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the answer, I think, is, Right, or or are we going to throw down a bunch of money into the void uh, in the hopes that, uh, you know, by investing in some kind of future thing? Um, I think I think in practice, what this will end up doing is changing essentially nothing. Maybe maybe you'll get a little more local. You know, the 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 companies that can in the U.S. will will increase production um, to some degree. Uh, but the. Uh, but politically, I think very little will change. And if it does change, it will be some kind of environmental activism disguised as a solution to the price of oil right now, mm -hmm. which it, which it won't have any real impact on. Um, so anyway, it's, it's an interesting question, energy and oil. And the, I, I hate that. I mean, Saudi Arabia and Russia are terrible and their countries would be very different if they didn't get massive amounts of money from oil. So I think any competition the US can bring to the international marketplace would undermine various dictators. I mean Saudi Arabia is a monarchy. It is it Saudi Arabia is the what was it the third or fourth largest spender on military in the entire world. It's crazy. And they're, they're like this like the Saudi Arabia is it's insane and it's all built on oil mm -hmm. and it's and if and if countries like the u.s for environmental reasons don't produce oil i mean we've got oil reserves in places like colorado that are absolutely absurdly big um the only thing we're doing is we're, we're creating environmental problems we're, we're worsening the environment by allowing people who make it less efficiently and with more pollution to make it and we're also i mean we're we're not we're not the cause of their dictatorships, right? But we could undermine them as well. We could improve the environment and we could undermine these these uh, terrible regimes by by doing something that would be economically good for us. <laughs> like it's uh, there's there's just a lot of things here that 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 bother me in terms of in terms of I, I think the reasoning I think we're stuck in this this perspective of 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 an oil spill and the damage it does and pollution that is actually like 40, maybe 50 years old at this point, just behind the times in terms of the science and the actual impact on, on the environment and what, and what our technology allows us to do in terms of pollution and those kind of things. And, and, and extremely optimistic of a future in which we don't need fossil fuels that just isn't close yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that we don't want to, we don't want to, narrow all of this down to to sound bites that that miss the mark you know to say it's it's fossil fuels versus uh green energy is is as you said mm -hmm. is is terrible because that's not possible you know as you said before we're in favor of of green energy options you know i I've, right. I've thought solar energy is is fantastic even on a personal level for a long time it doesn't change the fact that texas's power outage in large part had to do with the transition they made to solar and, and it re a reduced larger portion of it being it reduced on. their mm -hmm. ability to increase their production in high demand times. You know what I mean? It reduced their flexibility because fossil fuels have always been more flexible. You know, you, you, you can ramp up. Yeah. You can ramp up and ramp ramp down in ways that is much more difficult for renewable energy. Um, in case of, of solar, you know, or wind. Sorry, I, I said solar, but I meant wind. It was the, the huge wind farms in Texas that that are just unreliable because they only produce when they produce it. Um, 
But things like nuclear energy, even nuclear energy is is not the ultimate solution. If we had 100% nuclear energy in the United States, most nuclear power plants have no ramping capacity. You know, they just produce what yes. they produce. And, yes. And that, so they can make up a portion, but they can't, but they, be, they can't, can't be exclusive. They can't be exclusive. You know, you can't Unless take – Unless you want to just way overproduce. Yeah, you can't take <laughs> nuclear combined with solar and combined with wind and, and call that your solution – Unless you want to have, you know, huge overproduction or huge battery reserves that just doesn't make sense in the world yeah, that the we battery live in today. Don't it doesn't, make sense, yeah. It doesn't work. Yeah. And there's just – and it's – and there's so much more than that. I mean we talk about like this is a plastic world that we live in. Most plastics are produced from some some form of oil and that's something that in many cases we – um, outsourced to other countries because the emissions from plastic creation we consider too much and the the safety standards in the u.s are too high so we don't do it here we have them do it in, in an even lower standard in another country instead of having some middle ground standard here and producing it here much more efficiently um yeah, but these are examples of just the nonsense that goes on. You know, we can be in a situation where we're producing oil here, shipping that oil to another country so they can make the plastic and then ship the plastic back to us instead of us yeah. just making the plastic here because of political reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In some cases, in, entirely driven out of concern for the environment. Mm -hmm. We've made the environment. We've, we've, uh, had a larger negative impact on the world. Yes, less less negative impact perhaps in our in our own backyard, but uh but worse in general for the world. Yeah, it's it's interesting and it's a it's a it's a sphere that I feel like uh could change in the near future. I hope I hope people maybe if if nothing else maybe people are starting to think about uh nuclear energy and stuff especially as Germany like kicks up its uh or is talking about it at least kicking up their nuclear uh power again which they had moved away from. Um, speaking of nuclear, and, and this will probably be the last thing for today. We've gone quite a while. Um, we'll talk, we'll talk Putin's motivation, which I, well, well, quick summary, Putin's motivation. We talked about it last time. I think, I think our assessment from last week has withstood the changes and the further information. I like, I like our theory, um, as an explanation of Putin's and our, motivation. And our theory, and just a recap is that is that Putin wasn't planning on this going down the way that it was. He was planning on there being a false flag, having an excuse, and therefore holding off worldwide sanctioning, holding off the public outcry, at least on a, on a worldwide level, that would allow him to, you know, either conquer Ukraine, set up some kind of proxy government, something along those lines, and for the most part, avoid really most of what's gone on here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A, a false, a good false flag would have divided even the Ukrainian people to some degree. Um, so they'd be less, uh, you know, they would defend less. Uh, his people would have much higher morale and he wouldn't get the protests at home. The international community wouldn't sanction, as you said, it would just, it'd just be very different world if there, if that smoke screen worked, if there was a smoke screen at the beginning and it was effective. Um, he, uh, people were talking about looking for an off ramp. If you, if you want now Russia is committed. They've sent troops in. It's an, it's now a point of pride in some ways. That if they if they back down, they look they look even worse mm -hmm. in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, the idea of an off ramp is how do you diplomatically diffuse the situation in a way that lets lets you start thinking in terms of uh, you know of putting this behind you, looking to the future, no longer being enemies, and and. Putin being the aggressor, saving face. Um, so what what could you give to Putin? What concessions, what negotiations, what can you grant to him that allows him to say, we won? And and to have some kind of story that allows, you know, allows this to end and ideally end permanently. Um, and that's that's the kind of the the level of diplomacy that people are looking at and how you how you try and negotiate from here. Because as it is, it doesn't look like he's going to just, it, it would be so bad if he just went home and was like, yeah, we lost. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like, like it, there's just no, if he wants to keep his life and his job, that's probably not the way to do it. Um, so 
anyway. But that that I've heard a lot of good analysis of this actually from from a variety of people. So we'll we can forbear on that and talk nuclear war, which is something that I hear a lot of talk about that makes very little sense or that it, that isn't isn't quite as uh, I think on point. Um, fun fact: intercontinental ballistic missiles ICBMs are crazy. <laughs> We learned some things. Dan, Dan just learned that that ICBMs are 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 crazy. I well, I I had some sense, well, obviously, that these the are 70s, another kind. <laughs> You've caught up. That, you were telling me that they fly at fifteen thousand miles per hour, potentially, potentially, to- potentially. Yes, yes. And so I I would assume that a U.S. ICBM is above 10,000 miles per hour. Um, that is so fast. And I've, he- I've heard things like, you know, from here, an intercontinental ballistic missile can hit this place in this amount of time. Mm-hmm. But I'd never given it much thought. Never really given it much thought. They are so fast. Um, at 15,000 miles per hour, they're covering, did you say four, four miles? Four miles per second, approximately. I don't, you would, <laughs> that, how, how do you even comprehend what that looks like? I get it. Yeah, nothing moves that fast except rocket ships and satellites that are orbiting the earth. Right? Nothing, nothing is within that range. Like I think, I think to break into orbit, you've got to be going like 18,000 miles an hour or something like yeah, that. Yeah. In, in this atmosphere things don't move that fast. And yes. as they come back into the atmosphere, they do slow down, but they're that's still right, going right. crazy, crazy fast. No, that's true. I bet within within the levels of atmosphere that these are passing through, and I, I, I'm not sure exactly what height they attain. It's it's probably really high. You'd want to, there, there's going to be a point mathematically where you've maximized the the trajectory and the atmosphere and different things. And so that you're, uh, you're accurate and you're traveling, and you're not going to hit other things and you're going to, uh, uh, maximize fuel consumption and things like that and speed. Um, and there'll be trade-offs of course, but, but you, you find optimal, uh, ranges and heights and things like that, um, mathematically. And it, it's just, that is so fast. Um, one of the interesting things that you said, welcome to the seventies. <laughs> There's another way in which the conversation is stuck in the seventies. When we talked about nuclear power plants, most of the myths that that need to be refuted to get people comfortable with nuclear power have been around since the 70s mm-hmm. and 80s and it's as if it's as if time froze and what happened then is what would happen now if we did it we've we've not improved in technology we've not improved in safety protocols we've not improved in anything yeah like chernobyl which took place in the 80s is a is a 70s era you know nuclear power plant with 70s era technology that was and this is crucial that was bad for the 70s this was not the standard (laughs) in the 70s this was worse than any other country's safety standards at that time yes it's and so it was the worst of the 70s but it's also the 70s you know it's not the 70s now technology has improved but People haven't caught on to that. Yes, especially especially like the technology of missiles was young at that point. Like a nuclear nuclear power, nuclear weapons were extremely young at that point. How to how to? Uh, I mean, I, I would be curious what the top speed of planes was at that point. I guarantee it was not anywhere close to 15,000. 15, you were well, it's, really it's looking, not now, but it's not now. Planes don't move that fast. They don't need to, but even if they wanted to, they couldn't come anywhere close to that speed. Um, you're saying an experimental fighter, uh, yeah, the X 15 hit over 4,000 miles per hour, yeah, but. But that's not realistic. Realistically, it's the fastest fighter jets actually move at about two thousand at max yes. speed. Yes, at max speed, which you, you know, and, and those are the the fastest yeah. fighters. Yeah, and there's a reason for that. Obviously, if you're a plane, you want to be able to turn, and if you want to turn, <laughs> but there's, you'll note that a rocket doesn't have much in the way of wingspan. 
<laughs> There's a reason for that. A missile doesn't have wings. <laughs> if you, the slightest adjustment would rip them off, and it's not going to help them go fast, straight forward. Um, they don't turn the minute the the Miniman <laughs> missiles last minute. They're like, oh no, we're targeting the wrong city. Right. Detour. Right. It's not how this works. Um, it's not how projectiles in space work. Uh, not outer space, just airspace. Inner space. Inner space. <laughs> I suppose. That's what we're going to call the atmosphere from now on. <laughs> inner space. We have inner space and outer space. We're hanging out here in inner space. That makes perfect sense, but weird that that's never used. What? Where did we get outer space? <laughs> anyway. Um, we're losing we it. Bad? We're losing it. Maybe it's a bad translation. Um, here's the thing. If you if you look at... And and Brad, you were you were absolutely right to point out that this is not a one to one comparison. If you look at what happens over in Israel when a shoulder mounted, generally shoulder mounted rocket is fired at Israel, it generally gets shot down. They have what's called the Iron Dome, which is a uh, automated system that is able to track rockets and is able to shoot them down with surprising efficiency. And, and I'm pretty sure that they're that, that they're using more than shoulder rockets, but continue. To, 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 you're right, you're right. Shoulder rockets are, are other uh, other land-based rockets, but not not we're not talking uh, huge missiles yeah. or uh, state-of-the-art mm -hmm. uh, weapons, though I'm sure it would do a fair job at least, and, and maybe an exceptional job even against those. An intercontinental ballistic missile because ICBM is painful for some reason to me. Uh, an ICBM is You'd rather say the word intercontinental. <laughs> yes, that's just rolls off the With what, the 17 syllables? <laughs> just rolls off the tongue, Brad. Rolls. Um, is moving at a speed that is absolutely bananas. And, but it is also generally launched at a much greater distance. Um, Moving at fifteen thousand miles per hour, or between ten and fifteen, or whatever, whatever is standard, fifteen at max. Um, you're crossing the world. You're, there's a significant upward trajectory. There's a downward at the end, right? So it's not all it's not all horizontal. And the world is uh, uh, what? What is the 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 world is round? Is that what you're circ... looking for? <laughs> no, because you're over you're over here the taking a stand the against the flat earthers. The, the circumference of the world is something like twenty four thousand miles. Uh, 24. What is this circumference of the world? Um, not particularly relevant, but the point I was going to make but, was but that, that the circumference, but the, circu the circumference of the world is going to be X and the circumference. Once you have ascended to a height way above the surface, right? That thousands of feet above the, the air, the circumference is then bigger, uh, bigger. Obviously the distance you're traveling is bigger and you're traveling at an arc to keep that, uh, to keep that height, obviously, I guess it's an arc around the circumference anyway, but you get the idea, right? So there's, there's going to be travel time and it's going to be slightly increased over the, the actual mileage of, of how the crow flies, as they say it, though, ironically, the crow also must descend and descend, but it's not going that high besides the point <laughs> as the threads just, just continue to untangle. <laughs> um, the point being, uh, it takes, it'll take minutes generally. Um, you can, you can see why if the rockets are moving, if the, the ICBMs are moving at a rate that fast, having them in Cuba is going to be much crazier and harder to defend against than having them in Russia. Even though in Russia, they will launch them north. Uh, we had a conversation about this. There's a, there's a, there's an air force fighter base, fighter base, bomber base in North Dakota. Why? Why on earth would you position in North Dakota? Because it's the shortest flight to Moscow. And they go right over the North Pole. That way they can um, bomb Santa on the way back. <laughs> they, can, they can pick up their presents. Um, anyway, what would happen? This is the way people are talking about uh, nuclear engagement. Now, we don't want a nuclear war with Russia. It is worst case scenario. And there are nuclear submarines out there. No one knows where they are. Um, I assume Russia has them. I assume we don't know where the Russian ones are. It's possible we do, but it's just really, 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 really hard to track things underwater. It's really hard to track things even a short distance underground with our modern technology. Um, it's extremely expensive and very difficult to do, and so we don't do it. Um, 
random archaeology fact. Back to our oil discussion about drilling for new <laughs> oil. <laughs> yeah, yes, we drill for new oil. We don't have like some kind of like a device that you can just go use with abandon to discover uh, discover deposits deep underground. We don't even have them for things a short distance underground. It's we can do it, but it's so ridiculously expensive. Anyway, uh, the submarines are the are the most frightening thing because they could be right off your coast, right? They could be relatively close to you, and they could fire intercontinental ballistic bl- 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 ICBMs from a short distance. Um, the good news is that it has been 50 years since we learned this was a threat. 50 years. Think about that for a second. And what have we done in the meantime? We've improved the speed of the missiles, and so no doubt so have our opponents, which makes it harder to stop. But but not but, much. I mean, basically, we not peaked. Much. ICBM technology peaked in the 70s and the 80s because that's when it mattered. Why would we spend, you know the the 2000s working on improving a missile that we have no intention of using yes yes um and uh and yet our defenses we we've had we've had 40 50 years to sit around and go how do we stop this from happening and for some reason a lot of news people talk like we have had zero answers to it mm-hmm. just just not far from where i live I forgot the name of the business again. <laughs> there's a there's a Lockheed military Martin. Lockheed Martin, thank you. There's a Lockheed Martin Missiles and Fire Missiles and Fire Control uh center over there. Um I know people who work for it. They the there are a variety of ways to stop a missile that has been launched, to detect that it has been launched, to see it coming, and to stop it before it becomes a threat. And we have spent a ridiculous amount of money developing it and you can see it in a minor form obviously it's going to be different in the iron dome that technology applied to ballistic missiles um which obviously have to cover a much wider area and i don't know i don't have a good idea because it's top secret (laughs) which and and this is why most people don't seem to know about this right it's not talked about publicly because it's it's absolutely crucial military facts that uh, are defensive capabilities. But I no doubt Russia knows that if they launch nuclear missiles at us and we launch no- nuclear missiles at them, it's very possible, and I would say it's very likely, their missiles do not hit us. Or most of missiles their missiles hit don't hit us. Most of their missiles, right. right. We're not going to get 100% effectiveness. And that makes a massive difference in the nuclear war. Mm-hmm. The nuclear war used to be Mutually assured destruction mm-hmm. was how people described it. We shoot missiles, they shoot missiles, lose lose. <laughs> You're looking for another application of lose lose. Mutually assured destruction is one of them. This is why people choose this. Um, the missiles are in the air. Great. Let's launch our missiles in the air, and the buttons have all been pressed, and now we just wait for the end of the world. That's how people keep talking about this. If we if we end up in a fight with Russia, mutually assured destruction. Um now, there is a lot of the world, probably, that doesn't have that defense capability, but the U.S. absolutely does, and they would deploy it at least in critical locations, at least in critical locations. And I would be surprised if they couldn't deploy it in a, in a, over a wide portion of at least the, the strategic targets. I guess if you threw a random missile at a random place in the U.S., it might hit home. But if you're targeting military installations, which is the only thing that makes sense, or political hubs and those kind of things, um, I expect that we would have a very good chance of shooting it down. Which changes the math, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Doesn't that change things? Mm-hmm. Can we breathe just a little bit easier? Um, yeah, the, the, we- that the world ending in thermonuclear war is just, it's, it's really not on the table. It's not. It's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident in saying this. If I'm wrong and you know what, the world ends up getting destroyed in a thermonuclear <laughs> war, go ahead, stop listening to the podcast. Be like, those guys don't know anything. Yeah. So if <laughs> that's right, that's right. At that point, feel free. We will stop. We'll just, we'll call it ourselves. You know you what? Don't it's like, yeah, don't listen away. to us anymore, guys. We were we'll, wrong. We'll, yeah. Well, as we blow up, um, 
I was going to say, the the big threat that people hear about, actually, and, and this is, it's funny, movies have tracked this actually pretty well. The big fear is dirty bombs, right? It's a, it's a, basically a nuclear warhead, but instead of strapped onto a missile, you've smuggled it into the city and you're going to detonate it on the ground. Why? Why would that be a useful tactic? Because we could shoot down the missile. Mm-hmm. The entire reason that this has become a scenario in books and film and games is because you uh, we have because defenses for the other options. We have defenses for other things. Yes. Yes. We couldn't stop. If you're just going to detonate it there on the ground, there's not really anything we can do about it. That's terrifying. Um, but it's also much harder to do than to launch a missile at us. Yeah, which which brings us to to why the on ramp will not be taken using using Dan's terminology that this isn't going to escalate to nuclear war, but that doesn't mean it's going to not escalate. I had too many negatives in there. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't mean that war is off. It the doesn't table. not mean that. <laughs> See if you were to make this a an obstacle course for you to understand. <laughs> uh, I I could be a politician. <laughs> you know there is a possibility that that Russia could go to war with NATO and it could be a conventional war that takes place over Ukraine. That could happen without it leading to nuclear war. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm not sure it's going to happen, but that is a possibility. I think right now the Western nations are working to avoid that, but. But I mean, it, this war is the, the war is surprisingly popular, and I could see I could see something happening. I could see the U.S. or other NATO nations getting sucked into a war here because it's politically expedient. And yes, and that's it is crazy. weird that it's the it's weird that it's the political leaders who are like no, and the people are like yeah. <laughs> usually, usually, eventually. The politicians follow the people Mm -hmm. and the people are Mm -hmm. willing. The people don't have to be willing to go to war. They just have to be willing to do things like a no fly zone Mm -hmm. and not really understand them. No. And and I think that's the thing is that the politicians understand that if they actually went to war, the people would regret it and the people would blame (laughs) them for it. Hopefully. Yeah. But maybe maybe that's right. Yeah. Hopefully cooler heads prevail for now in terms of but that leads us, escalating. But that leads us to, to where does this end? What does it look like? Does it does it end with Russia finally conquering Ukraine and these sanctions continuing and there being drastic economic consequences for Russia, but Russia continues to hold on to Ukraine out of stubbornness and it just sucks for everyone? Does it end with Ukraine with Russia backing out of Ukraine? but getting some concessions in order to save face? Does it end with total defeat of Russia and maybe Russia's uh, government and economy collapses and and that, you know, spawns Mm -hmm. another worldwide depression? I don't know. I don't know. But those are just some fun options. Yeah, I do like, I will say this, in terms of foreign policy, if I'm, if you're China or somebody who's looking to eat up some other little territory or country near you, um, I would say that this is a strong deterrent, even though the U.S. like the idea before was that the U.S. would have to like physically stop them. Otherwise, it would show weakness and China would go, yeah, I think it's time to grab Taiwan. Um, But with how bad this has been, even without military intervention, if I were China, I'd be like, not worth it. Like, <laughs> just It's just not going to be worth the sanctions and things. It's, it's, too unified a response to like clearly Russia's the bad guy. I just I don't I don't think I think this has actually been a strong deterrent, even though he still may win. Because it's just been a catastrophe for mm-hmm. Russia. Just disaster. And with that, thank you for listening. This has been an episode of Rethinking Politics. You can find us on all of the major podcasting apps or on YouTube. You can reach out to us at rethinkingpoliticspodcast at gmail.com or you can visit our website at rethinkingpolitics.podbean.com where you can support us via Patreon. Thanks and have a wonderful day.